Timmy, how you guys doing? Good. We're good. We're good. good to see you again, man. You're live on <laughs> YouTube. You <laughs> Where are yeah. you calling us from? I'm in Miami. In, oh, uh, awesome. <laughs> I'm Ivan's fellow this year. <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. We were just we were just reminiscing on how influential you are to Dom's career. Yeah. <laughs> I see, I see. Dom and I see each other and, and the good and the bad times. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, absolutely. Wait, let me swap this place. Can I try to share my screen just to make sure it works? Perfect. Go Go for it. Okay. Let's see, I have like a million. Oh. Open system. Of course, it doesn't work. I'm going to have to log in again. One second. No problem. I have like a, a five, seven minute intro anyway. So, nope, he's already gone. Not a problem. You guys could see my screen now, right? Yeah, but it's not in presentation yeah. mode. Now it's in presentation mode. Perfect. So we just have the background mode there. Yeah, you put it backwards. That was good. There it, there, there it is. It looks good. It looks yeah, good. Great. Right. right. I, I still. I now I see it in a weird way. No, but we can see it perfectly. You uh, see my uh, cursor? Yeah, the Zoom people can see it, and we can see the cursor. Correct. Okay. Perfect. No, not a presenter mode. Not on presenter mode. You're good. Okay. Uh, Dr. Awesome. Ivan, you want to share your screen? So yeah, I'm going to go back to my screen. Yeah, so we can there start the webinar. It's already Perfect. five. Okay, Perfect. we are starting five, four, three, two. We are live in our webinar. Okay, let's just give it one minute for everybody to, to join. Okay, great. Okay, welcome everybody uh, to this month's Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Uh, very excited for, for this month for our guest speaker uh, and to continue this uh, symposium on a monthly basis. Um, uh, again, we always wanna say thanks to everybody who's, who's helped us in the past, especially to the directors and the administrators uh, who really make this possible every week. I want to especially thank my co-directors, uh, Dr. Morcos, who's professor and co-chairman here at the University of Miami, Dr. Komatar, who's a program director of our residency program, and uh, Carolina Benjamin, who's director of our uh, skull base uh, Keynes lab, as well as all the administrators here, uh, Christina, Ingrid, Roberto, Damari, and Ignacio, who've just been extraordinarily helpful in putting this symposium together and continuing it. And just to remind everybody that uh, anything you miss uh, and any of the past or future symposiums can always be watched on YouTube. Uh, we try to even log in sometimes and respond to the comments. Uh, we have over 10,000 views already of, of all of the seminars that have been done by both uh, 
uh, the Brain Tumor Symposium, the Skull Basin Vascular Symposium, and the Pediatric Symposium. So please be sure to check those out if you missed any of them in the past. Um, so just sort of how housekeeping, we, we, the most important thing is really just we, make, we try to make this as interactive as possible. We try to get to everybody's questions. So please be use the Q&A button to, um, uh, to, to interact with us and we'll try to get to, to everybody throughout the talk tonight. Uh, this week we have again, uh, another Miami consortium of panelists, uh, Dr. Higgins who joins us, um, who's actually one of the mentees of our speaker tonight, uh, both from Columbia and both um, uh, have a strong science background. Dr. Patel, who joins us uh, from Rutgers and now our fellow, and Dr. Morell, who is actually our future clinical fellow, currently research fellow uh, at University of Miami. So thank you all for joining us. Tonight, uh, we, special, we, we, we uh, welcome a very special friend of mine, Dr. Sonoban, who's joining us all the way from Chicago early in the afternoon. And we thank him so much for, for separating out this part of his day to talk to us about, uh, he's doing so much work in so many different areas, but particularly he just had this uh, fantastic work published in Nature Medicine. And, uh, and, and we thought it was really uh, impactful and wanted to invite him to come speak to us. Dr. Sonobin, um, he grew up and, and did his medical training in Mexico, graduated first in his class and then uh, came to the United States, did research in Chicago before going to Columbia where he did his residency program uh, for neurosurgery. Uh, then shortly after he joined Northwestern, has been extremely productive, uh, has many, many publications, uh, a long list of awards that I won't go through and an NEH funded uh, research lab uh, where he um, really focuses on treatments for glioblastoma. Uh, so Adam, uh, thank you so much and congrats on your recent success. And we're really looking forward to your talk tonight. Thank you, Michael, uh, and the organizers are really, it's an honor to, to share some of the work that we're doing here. Uh, I'll just jump right in. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Uh, not yet, just reshare it. Okay, one second. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, we yeah, can. that looks great. We can Perfect. see you and hear you. Excellent. So first, uh, starting with uh, conflict disclosure, I'm an author and some of the patents related uh, to some of the work will be presented today. Um, unfortunately, no, no revenue so far. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to start by explaining the rationale for doing this investigation. Uh, and maybe start the talk with a little bit of an anecdotal background. Maybe it's a... Uh, six or seven, seven years now that I started a practice coming out of residency operating in, in brain tumors uh, at the time I was faculty at Columbia. And, uh, you know, most of the gliomas I was doing were recurrent glioblastomas. And this is a really tough, uh, not that it's much easier now, but it was a really tough uh, um, situation to be in because just like there's a clear path for how glioblastoma patients need to be treated when they're first diagnosed, you know, when the tumors come back, there's really nothing, no great evidence uh, supporting any kind of treatment that would show that it would make people live longer. So this is what I was calling at that point, no man's land. It was not clear what needs to be uh, done for these patients. As, as, uh, as we know, as surgeons, we can do, a, I think, a great job and get a patient symptoms to improve when they're related to mass effect. We can actually get great looking MRIs and, and great surgery, but, but you know that these victories are not long lasting and these tumors ultimately come back. What was special about that period is that there had been a, a major revolution in cancer care. There's two people getting Nobel prizes. There's a lethal cancers that had a reputation as bad as glioblastoma, such as melanoma and lung cancer, suddenly having long-term remissions for patients who had very advanced disease. And this big revolution was related to immunotherapy for, for, for cancer. And, and the first uh, few agents approved were, were PD-1 blockade agents. Uh, it was really remarkable. And the unique aspect of that period is that there was no negative data for glioblastoma when I started. So at that point, well, you know, the rationale is you works in all these other cancers. We have nothing to offer to these patients. I just did a nice surgery and I got a tumor out and the scan looks good. Patient's doing well. 
what next? And and I was maybe partnering with a colleague of mine, Fabio Iwamoto, who's a great neuro-oncologist there. And we were just, every patient systematically treating with PD-1 blockade. And we kept doing this over and over. And I will uh, confess, most of the times we would get pretty disappointed by the, the results. But occasionally we would have something that really looked like a response and patients do well. We had very severe inflammatory responses. And some patients were outliving our expectations, and, and that was really interesting. Uh, of course, uh, as we started getting more interested in it, uh, the results of the large randomized phase three clinical trials started coming out, starting with the Checkmate 143, showing really no overall survival benefit for these patients compared to uh, uh, BEV um, in the recurrent setting. So. By then we had already treated roughly 60 something patients. And it was really interesting because we were seeing some patients that maybe didn't read that paper or if you will, or that just had a really nice response to where there was this dichotomy between what the overall survival data was showing and some of the anecdotal experience we were getting. Um, and so we were very motivated to try to determine what was different about these patients. And, and we did a very nice partnership between me and, and Fabio and Raul Rabadan. And we decided we were going to study these tumors in a systematic way in an unbiased fashion and try to determine what makes these patients somehow different. And so this was a retrospective study in which we uh, treated, uh, evaluated patients were treated with PD-1 blockade at recurrent setting. Uh, we included 66 patients. And, in order to figure out what's different about them, we needed to define success. We needed to define response. And the way we defined that was both radiographical or pathological. And so radiographic response was defined as over six months of stable disease after beginning of immunotherapy, which I thought was a stringent definition considering most patients, the median survival after recurrence is about nine months. And then pathological, well, if a patient had a tumor that appeared to be growing and we happened to take the patient to the operating room, occasionally we would see that in fact, uh, there was no tumor. There was just really a massive inflammatory infiltrate and what appears to be enhancing disease was just a, a pseudo progression. So if a patient had that scenario, we would consider that also a responder. And what we did on this, uh, paper is we considered that all these variables, demographic, therapy, imaging, survival, gene expression, genetic, and histological. And, and we looked at all these different things and we studied somatic mutations, copy number variants, HLA typing, neoantigen predictions, tumor purity, employee, differential expression, TCR profiling, immune infiltration. Um, and some of the interesting thing that we discovered right away is that our definition of response, which was purely based on imaging and or pathology, did not involve survival, was actually associated with patients living longer. So if the patient we were calling responders were actually going to live longer. And what's really special and interesting is that we took every other potential confounder factor that, that has been published out there, whether patients were on steroids, uh, the, the whether it was the first recurrence, what PD-1 inhibitor this was, uh, whether a patient got re-radiation, temozolomide, uh, gender, and, and none of these had such an important impact on, uh, on survival like response did. So you can see here the overall survival curve for responders and non-responders really show that these two kinds of patients were uh, living differently. <clears throat> Here's two examples. Uh, at the time this was ongoing, I actually had a uh, relocated to Northwestern and I was able to add a few extra patients from Northwestern. And these are actually two Northwestern patients that I included on this study. Um, this first patient, NU7, was started with PD-1 blockade. And within six months, uh, you know, he had progression within two months and, and eventually passed away. And you can see here the progression very quickly. Whereas NU11, it's a patient that went on for about 17 months without uh, seeing any additional uh, tumor growth. And so we then did uh, this genomic characterization. This is worked on uh, closely in collaboration with Raul Rabadan and his team. And we looked at all the genetic alterations. And what was really interesting here is that uh, 
P10 mutation and a deletion, which is a very common thing in glioblastoma present maybe in about half of the patients, was somehow overrepresented in the non-responders. That's uh, maybe interesting and perhaps compelling, but really anticlimactic when trying to figure out how to treat patients, because it's not great to have a negative biomarker that tells you who's going to do poorly. You would really like to get a biomarker that would explain who might actually do well with this treatment. On the other hand, the other interesting finding here is that there were two mutations in two genes, one in BRAF and the other one in PTPN11, that were really overrepresented in the responders. These two mutations are very rare. If you look at the number of patients that have this with glioblastoma, it ranges between two to 3%. Uh, but they're actually present in 30% of the responders. And what's really interesting is that these two genes that are different from each other, they both are effectors of the MAP kinase pathway. Uh, and both of these mutations have been reported to activate this signaling cascade in glioblastoma. And so I'll show you here um, the overrepresentation of these two mutations versus the background of the TCGA patients, the uh, BRAF PTPN11 and the responders and, P, uh, and P10 and the non responders, and also the overrepresentation of the responders versus the non responders, including. These two that were uh, in the responders and these in the non-responders. Um, so we, at that point, had determined that there was something to map kinase pathway. And it was interesting, but honestly, it was not really sufficient to use this for clinical care. Because if I were going to talk to a patient, I would say, let's do this uh, assay. And you have 2 to 3% chances of having a positive result that might imply that you might do well with this uh, immunotherapy. But if you do not get this result, you can still maybe benefit from this immunotherapy as 70% of the patients that benefit didn't have this. You know, it's, it's really not a practical biomarker and no patient probably would go for that. Uh, but I thought of that as a clue because why would two separate genes have activating mutations that are super unlikely are tenfold more likely to happen in responders. Both tend to signal that MAP kinase signaling has something to do with this. And so at that point, I was motivated to do the second uh, uh, analysis that we recently published in Nature Cancer. This I would like to make here a parenthesis. This is the work by a postdoc and, and, and a former uh, medical student in my lab, Victor Arrieta, who I like to make a parenthesis and say that he will be applying for neurosurgery next year, stellar applicant, look out for him. And so anyway, when, when I started this, I said, Victor, why don't we try to figure out if just the tumors of patients that respond to immunotherapy have MAP kinase activation, regardless of whether they have a mutation or not. And so that's what uh, Victor work is centered on. And if you, not to bore you with a very complicated a cartoon of the MAP kinase pathway, but suffice to say that at the top you have RAS and RAS phosphorylates RAF, including BRAF, uh, and MEC1 also phosphorylates uh, MEC2, and RAF phosphorylates MEC2. And so all these genes that we saw mutated, including BRAF um, and, and PTPN11, that is like right here, it's a phosphatase, end up phosphorylating ultimately. ERK. And ERK phosphorylation is actually a very nice way to see whether the pathway is active or not. And what was really cool and convenient is that there's really nice antibodies that can let you figure out if ERK is phosphorylated in tumors or not. And so these antibodies are monoclonal, they're nicely established. There's, I think for this antibody that we use, there's I think 40,000 citations for this work. It's a really nicely established antibody that works really well. And so what we did is we took patients, uh, tumors, uh, and, and we took on stained slides and we started staining for phosphorylated ERK. Of course, there's tumor heterogeneity and there's on any given slide areas that have tumor and areas that don't have tumor. In order to center our analysis on the tumor regions, we had a blinded pathologist who uh, outlined the tumor regions. And we really then scanned those tumor regions for ERK phosphorylation. And we used the machine learning algorithm and we set up a threshold and we segmented individual cells. 
And then we determine with a threshold what percentage or how many cells on a square millimeter of tumor are positive for, for, for related errors. And what we did is we did this in a cohort of patients that got adjuvant PD-1 blockade. There were 29 patients. But in order to determine whether this is a predictive biomarker or not, we did the same analysis in a similar size cohort of patients with recurrent glioblastoma that never got immunotherapy. And what I'll tell you right now is that there were no real clinical differences between these two cohorts of patients. Uh, they had similar age, male to female ratio, Karnofsky, uh, MGMT promoter methylation, and IDH1 mutation status. So nothing different between these two groups of patients. Uh, the other very important point, and anybody who's savvy about molecular biology and phosphoproteomics will right away tell you, well, yeah, but phospho... Uh, proteomics are very labile and you will actually have degradation of the phosphorylation very quickly. And of course, this is a problem. And it's a problem I wanna warn you of because if you were to consider this for a clinical trial that you're working or for trying this on a patient, you need to make sure that the sample that you have has enough and high quality tumor where ERK has not been degraded. Um, it's important to know if a sample is low that it is because there's just not MAP kinase activation in that tumor and it's not because the sample was sitting around for too long. And what's really nice and convenient is that it turns out that the endothelium, which is something that is easy to find in glioblastoma, really has very strong signaling for MAP kinase. So you can see here there's an endothelial uh, cells and capillaries, and there's a lot of straining for a uh, phosphorylated earth. Uh, you see here a different sample, a different specimen. There's also a lot of staining. This other one that has very little uh, phosphorylated earth in the tumor still has um, phosphorylated earth in the endothelium. And so in order to get some mental peace of mind that the samples that we were dealing with all had good quality, what we did is we took glioblastoma samples. I was operating on these patients and we would extract the tumor and we would split the tumor into several pieces. One piece we would fix immediately. Another one would wait half an hour, just let it sit there. Another one for an hour, another one for two hours. We did this over and over and then we stained. We started quantifying the intensity of earth staining in the endothelium. And by doing this with these three patients, as you can see here, we showed that up for the first hour, there's no real degradation of ERK. But after at hour two and afterwards, you start to see degradation. And so we knew as long as the patient specimens have been waiting for less than an hour before being fixed, they were going to be easy to assess. And what we then did is we took the core of patients that we had done, uh, we were considering for this analysis, and just look at how much endothelial PR staining there was. And we never found any significant decrease in any of these samples compared to the specimens that we fixed immediately. We also extracted protein and we were able to determine that for PR and for other uh, phosphoproteins, uh, the degradation started really around two hours as I can show right here. Um, the other point that we wanted to prove to be very rigorous about this is that whatever staining we were getting was truly representing phosphorylated ERK. And in order to do that, what we uh, did is we bought this uh, neutralizing peptide that competes uh, for the antibody. So when you add the neutralizing pure peptide, you lose the staining, both by immunohistochemistry as well as for Western blood. You can see here the pure staining on these patient samples and in cell lines. But when you add this phosphopeptide, you lose the PRX staining, but you do not lose the staining of other phosphoproteins. So we knew that the specimens we were dealing with had high quality and well, were, uh, well preserved to study ERK phosphorylation. But we also knew that we had an antibody that in the conditions we were using was actually really staining specifically for PRX. So once we had these technical hurdles overcome, uh, we started analyzing these uh, patient cohorts. This is actually an interesting patient of mine at Columbia. As you can see, he had this very massive uh, bifrontal glioblastoma that was already recurrent. Uh, and I, I operated on him. Uh, he did well from surgery. He was actually BRAF mutant. This is one of the patients that had BRAF mutation. We started him on PD-1 blockade. And uh, this is a scan two weeks later. 
And actually about 10 months after surgery, he was still on P1 blockade. He already outlived the median survival for patients with recurrent glioblastoma. At that point, he developed massive hydrocephalus. It was very difficult to manage. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Dominic remembers this patient because we really had a very hard time dealing with this hydrocephalus. It was extremely low pressure. There was a lot of protein in the CSF, and it was really difficult because his, his, the viscosity of his fluid was really, really profound. And as we got the ventricular drain on this patient, we, we obtained CSF. But at some point, I also performed a biopsy because it seemed like this uh, lesion in the right frontal area uh, exhibited some growth over the last 10 months. And we needed to know whether this was actual recurrence after immunotherapy or whether she, he should continue on immunotherapy. And so we biopsy that. And interestingly, when we did uh, analysis by flow cytometry, the resected tissue had a lot of uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells, same thing as the cerebrospinal fluid. And when you stain his tumor, initially, no surprise because he had a BVF mutation, had a lot of phosphorylated ERK. Of course, he had uh, ERK also in the endothelium proving that the quality of his sample was good. But when we did this biopsy 10 months later, we didn't really find any viable tumor and the pathologists were saying, this is just a, a, an inflammatory profile. And when we stand for a CD3, we saw it was full of T cells. And so here as a way of a comparison, there was another patient, this is a Northwestern patient who started uh, after surgery, it was started on uh, immunotherapy. And uh, two months later, he exhibited some progression. He was dead by six months later. We stained uh, his tumor for a phosphorylation of ERK and we did not find a significant elevation of it, but we still had staining in endothelium proving that the sample was good. So when you look at our definition of responders versus not, the responders had high uh, elevated ERK, whereas the non-responders had a spectrum. This is very important. I, I don't want to oversell this biomarker. There's a good chance that a patient that has elevated ERK might not be a responder. But what we never observe is that a patient that did well had low levels of PR. And so of course we don't care about response and uh, MRI findings. Uh, what we really care is about how long do these uh, patients live? And so we abandoned the radiographic definition of response and we focus now really on how long were people living. And there's two ways to do this kind of analysis. One is with a Kaplan-Meier log run test in which we would basically take the spectrum of peer values and cut them right in the middle. So we would use in the, the median for peer. And when you do that, you can generate these Kaplan-Meier curves and you can see the, the cord with no immunotherapy had no difference in survival for high versus low peer. The patients that had PD-1 blockade, actually it was a significant uh, longer overall survival of patients with high peer compared to the low peer. But also these high peer patients that got PD-1 blockade were living significantly longer than the high peer that did not get immunotherapy. And so this was exciting. The more rigorous way to do this analysis is in a continuous fashion. That's what we use the Cox model for. In other words, the question is, is this survival difference that we've seen uh, somehow an artifact based on how we split the data or would you have this no matter how you split it? And the continuous analysis would say, well, for every increment of phosphorylated ERK, patients should live longer. And it turns out that this was the case. Uh, you can see here, PR was uh, protective for overall survival on this core that of patients who got immunotherapy and the univariate, as well as in the multivariate analysis. Uh, but then we applied the same analysis for patients that did not get immunotherapy. And of course, PR had no bearing whatsoever on the overall survival. With this in mind, I think we, we, we can think of this as a predictive biomarker as opposed to a prognostic biomarker. These uh, rock curves are very important standard. The ideal rock curve will have basically a area under the curve of one. And so ours was 0.78. Um, and then no immunotherapy cord behaves almost as random. And so this was exciting, but of course, the um, question is, can this be reproduced? And is this actually uh, something we just got lucky on or can you do it again? Um, so that's, that's something we'll, we'll get to in a minute. The other important point here is, is exactly the motivation for starting this second paper, this second analysis that we did not resolve on the Nature Medicine previous publication, which is, can we now really identify patients 
they will survive long after immunotherapy, even if they don't have these mutations? And the answer is yes. If you take, again, just like with response, the overall survival for patients that live past one year, they had significantly higher PR than the patients that live less than a year. Of course, the patients that live less than a year, some also had high PR, but there were no patients that live past one year that had low PR. And what's really interesting here is that you can see in orange, these are the wild type BRAF and PTP in 11. The blue are the ones that have the mutations and the, the pink are the ones that we do not know. So you can see here, we were capturing some of the patients that live long in spite of not having the mutation. So we're suddenly identifying the patients that actually will do well, even though they don't have these mutations. So with regards to whether we can make this uh, same analysis be reproducible in a separate cohort, I reach out to my colleagues at UCLA and, and Robert Prince was really instrumental in these. Uh, they had recently published a paper along with us in, in Nature Medicine, uh, where they showed that their uh, PD-1 blockade would exhibit better survival when given in the neoadjuvant setting. And in this case, I asked them whether I could get access to the samples of patients that were treated in the adjuvant setting. And so what was really interesting about this is that they gave me two samples per patient, one sample from when the patient was first diagnosed and another sample for when the patient was started on the clinical trial. And the first thing we wanted to know is what happens over time to phosphorylated ERK. And the answer is actually really interesting and chaotic. It's a mess. Basically, most patients that had elevated PR at diagnosis became low PR at uh, recurrence when they started immunotherapy. Most patients that were low became high. So it was completely erratic. And what's interesting is if you take the at diagnosis PR levels, they wouldn't really predict survival of these patients when the tumor recurred and you gave them PR perhaps a year or two, I'm sorry, you give immunotherapy perhaps a year or two after. This was not really going to work if you use an obsolete specimen. Yet, if you take the samples collected on study when the patient got surgery during the clinical trial and they were started immunotherapy within a few weeks, actually there was a very nice uh, reproducibility of our previous finding. And you can see the patient that had high PR had longer overall survival than the patient that had low PR. This was true in the univariate as well as the multivariate analysis. And the area under the curve in this case on this rock curve look even better than on our discovery cohort. And so we now have established this correlation between PR, but it wasn't really clear, first of all, who is expressing PR when you do immunohistochemistry? You can't really tell necessarily that these are the tumor cells, but also what's different about these tumors? Why is PR associated with this uh, outcome? And so the first thing we did is a multiplex immunofluorescence analysis where we started looking at which cells had higher levels of phosphorylated ERK. And the SOX2 is a marker, established marker for gliomas, for glioma cells. TMEM119 is for microglia and CD163 is for myeloid cells. And what you can see here is most of the expression was by tumor cells. Uh, other cells contributed as well, but really most of the PR was coming from the tumor cells. Uh, the other interesting thing as we, we are expecting is the patients that had high PR defined by the median, by immunohistochemistry, which is the biomarker that we use for predicting response and survival. <clears throat> Their SOX2 positive cells were the ones that were expressing more PR. Uh, what's really interesting also is that <clears throat> these patients also just had much more microglia in their tumors, as you can see right here. Um, interestingly, the myeloid cells, which tend to infiltrate the, the tumors, had really not much difference uh, between high and low PR patients. It was really the microglia that was much more abundant in these patients. And when you look at this marker, IBA1, uh, correlated really nice with phosphorylated ERK by immunohistochemistry. So here you can see some representative multiplex images where SOX2 are the blue cells and the green cells are phosphorylated ERK cells. And you can see how this patient that had a lot of PR had a lot of TMEM119. You can see there's a lot of purple. And also that the PR is expressed by the SOX2 positive cells. 
This other patient that also had elevated PR but did not have the BRF mutation had a similar findings with a lot of microglia and the PRX expressed by tumor cells. And this patient had very little expression of phosphorylated ERK, uh, as you can see here, also had minimal microglia in there. So there's something special about microglia, we thought, and we wanted to investigate that further. Um, so the first thing we said, well, you know, if there's more microglia, perhaps microglia are closer to uh, PRX positive cells. And you might think of this as an obvious conclusion. And we proved that, uh, and I think it's, it is obvious, but might actually have some mechanistic meaning because <clears throat> if the tumor cells have this signaling cascade activated and that is leading to an enhanced immune response and there's more microglia, I guess if they're closer, there might be an opportunity for this to have some paracrine uh, interactions or signaling uh, or communicate by some means. And so, we did this analysis where we were measuring the distances. And, and what you can see right here is that the distance of SOX2 positive, PR positive cells to microglia was shorter when the PR uh, patients were high compared to when they were low. But for the PR negative tumor cells, there was no difference. And uh, we found a similar trend for uh, myeloid cells, um, but not when the PR was negative for PR negative tumor cells. We did the same analysis using GFAP as a, a separate marker for tumor cells. No marker is perfect. SOX2 is maybe more specific, but might not capture all the cells. GFAP might be more widely distributed, but might also be labeling some astroglial cells that are not necessarily tumor, but actually showed a very similar uh, result. So clearly tumor cells that have elevated PR were somehow closer to microglia uh, than the negative. And so we wanted to really understand whether there was anything different to these microglia cells. And, and we wanted to do this in a way that was unbiased. And so in order to do that, we did a paired analysis. We took 10 patients <clears throat> for which we could stain for PR. So we would know the phosphoproteomics aspect of MAP kinase signaling. It's the best way to determine whether this pathway is activated. But these same, the same 10 patients were also analyzed by single cell RNA sequencing. And so we split these 10 patients into patients with high PR and low PR using the same definition as we used before, which is the median. And we looked at the different cellular components by single cell RNA seq. You can see different things segregate very nicely. And you can see here the high PR uh, tumors are separate from the low PR tumors that you can see here. But this cloud right here represents the cluster of cells that are myeloid cells. And <clears throat> what you can see right here is that high PR, uh, myeloid cells from patients with high PR tumors tend to localize at this lower uh, area of the cloud. Uh, and that's the area of the cloud that had also enrichment for a se several gene sets, but most importantly, MHC class two expressing a protein complex. And so here's a, a gene ontology analysis of the genes that were differentially expressed in the myeloid cells of the tumors that from high PR versus low PR. And you can see MHC class two protein complex is, is the top team. But there are other interesting phenotypic differences uh, related to T cell activation and several other immune related responses. We, we focus on the MHC class two because it was the most robust finding and of course, uh, you know, RNA should in principle always be validated. So we went back to these tumors <clears throat> and perform an analysis of multiplexing like we did before, but now to the, ask the question of whether MHC class two was more expressed in the microglia cells or, or in the myeloid cells from patients that had elevated PR. And what was really interesting is you can see right here, microglia, which is labeled by TMN119, had significantly more MHC class two expression on the patient that had high PR versus the patients that had low PR. Whereas myeloid cells showed a similar trend, but was not maybe as strong. So we really think most of the action, at least phenotypically speaking in the microenvironment is different in the microglial cells, as opposed to the uh, myeloid derived uh, uh, suppressor cells. So it's a, I'll try to keep it short. I'm gonna just conclude a few things here. But immunostochemistry for ERK1-2 phosphorylation, otherwise colloquially known as PIRC, 
showed that the peer was predictive of response and overall survival following adjuvant PD-1 blockade in a discovery and an independent validation court. Whereas not all tumors with elevated PR were responders, all responders had PR elevation. So the question here in my mind is, is PR map kinase maybe necessary, but not sufficient for response? I'm sure there's more to response than just this aspect. Timing of biopsy really influenced prediction. I really think this is important. We often do uh, surgery and recurrent glioblastoma for symptomatic relief. If this biomarker were to be validated prospectively and these were to take off, I think there would be uh, an indication to perform surgery to actually get fresh tumor to, to run this kind of biomarker. Um, PR was mainly localized to tumor cells. Elevated PR uh, in glioblastoma is, it contained tumor infiltrated myeloid cells and microglia with elevated expression of MHC class two genes. And most importantly, I, I, I as excited as I might be about this work, I'm not sure this is ready for prime time. It is interesting. I consider this to be hypothesis generating, but in order for this to make it mainstream, I think prospective validation and proper clinical trial needs to be done. And um, this is probably the most important slide I, I have really, uh, I'm just representing here the work of many people in, in, in my lab. We, we are a growing group. Uh, I have several very important collaborators. I mentioned some of them today, including Fabio and, and Raul, but I have also very generous support from NCI, uh, NINDS, and, and the uh, Office of the NIH Director, as well as philanthropic support here. So I, I will finish right there, and, and I'm happy to, to engage in the discussion. Look forward to it. Great, great talk, Adam. That was really um, some phenomenal work, and it's really helping us understand how to unlock immunotherapy, which has been a mystery to, you know, we've all been so hopeful for it for such a long time. We've seen the vaccines come through, we've seen immunotherapy come through, and, and it's been so depressing to the clinical and research society just to not see that, even though I feel, we all feel like there's still something there. So this is a great step forward and trying to unlock that to see how we could use it. Uh, I, I had a couple questions. Um, one was you showed that great correlation of the microglia at the end to the high PRC um, uh, concentrations. And so how do you know that it's just not tumor cells that have a, a more uh, robust microenvironment or have tumor cell or tumors that have more microglia that are, that, and that's the main cause of them responding um, more than just the PRC? I think this is a great question, and I think it speaks to the limitation of the study that I, 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 I did. Everything I'm showing you done in humans so far is correlations. I yeah. can't, there's, there's no causality in any of the slides on this talk. Um, in order to look at causality, you need to mess up with PR in the tumor cells and see what happens to the environment. And I do have some work related to that that I'm not presenting today for sake of brevity, brevity but it's a great point. I think what's clear to me is that elevated PRC in the tumors comes with more microglia that are different. I can't really claim that it is because the elevated PRC that this microglia is different. Totally agree with you. Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of a, a setup to the second question, which is a little bit more general, which is, you know, it, it's so great to see somebody who is a surgeon really taking the samples from patients and working the problem backwards versus a lot of us are, you know, trying to, to work in, in the lab and, and use cell lines and mouse and whatnot, and then try to then take that into humans. And I think more of what you're doing is needed, but it brings up the question of how do you now reverse engineer this? How do you take this back to the lab and, and set up a model where you could do exactly what you just said is to up regulate, down regulate, find the pathways and, and, and interrogate that? What is your solution to the models for immunotherapy? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate this. It's a great question. You know, there's this saying out there, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Yeah. Uh, a great statistician said that at some point. So I, I think, and I'm very humbled by all of these, I think it's very hard to start a project in vitro and then get a mouse experiment that shows what you expect and then suddenly expect that to make a survival difference in a clinical trial. And um, I think a lot of very, very transformative research started with a clinical observation. And so I think it's less risky, even though it might seem more convoluted to start with a clinical analysis. Uh, 
what I like about the work we've, we've done, and I think was somehow kept us in check, is that we started super unbiased. And so the, the, the hypothesis is, if there is a gene that will make a difference, we're gonna find it because we're looking at all the genes. And so if you have something to start that is super unbiased, then working your way into more hypothesis driven research, like, okay, we found map kinase after looking at all genes. Well, can we now focus on map kinase? That's what we did on the second paper. And then from there, going from correlation to causality, well, can now we mess with map kinase and see whether we can change that? And that's now a reasonable thing to do in mice. But that's that's been my approach, or at least what I thought was uh, helpful in this story is to start unbiased human observation, maybe start with a strong correlation and then uh, lead to causality. Uh, in a short uh, answer to the other question you mentioned, we've done some uh, uh, provocative experiments where we basically using CRISPR to knock out all the kinases in the genome in tumor cells, and then we inject them into mice. Uh, and, and intracranially. And then you can see the contribution of every one of the kinases, including MAP kinase or not, to see whether they really contribute to response to immunotherapy or not. So this is some of the work that we haven't published that we, we're, we're wrapping up right now to, to, to send out there, but there's very nice things you could do. If you start with a hypothesis, right? You could do this for kinases, but you could have done it for epigenetic modulators. Well, we chose kinases because we already have all these human observations there. So. I don't know, I'm a short answer to that, but I agree with you. Great, great. Yeah, let me open it up to the rest of the panelists here to see if they can answer questions. Hey, Adam, uh, great talk. Um, yeah, I definitely remember that patient that you're referring to <laughs> in a, a lot of days on rounds and, and a lot of sessions uh, trying to manage a difficult, difficult uh, post-op period. But um, great talk, great body of research um, and inspirations all of us uh, surgeon scientists. Um, I guess to piggyback off, um, you know, Dr. Ivan's question, um, do you see, um, it, I guess, I guess it, if you were to overexpress or, or overactivate the MAP kinase or ERK, do you think that would convert a non-responder into a responder? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I, I really believe that MAP kinase is necessary, but not sufficient. Okay. And so I think it might work in some occasions, but not in all, as we see on the data. I don't know that uh, it could happen without it, but, but mm -hmm. I, I think if everything else was inconvenient, maybe tumor is not antigenic or, or whatever reason, I don't think it would work. So I don't think it's a holy grail. Okay. And, and do you think, uh, I guess to follow up on that, ERK is more of like a readout um, for response in the pathway, or do you think it's, it's actually playing a pivotal role in terms of generating um, the response to treatment? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have actually knocked out and overexpressed phosphorylated ERK, and we do think ERK itself contributes uh, okay. based on mouse experiments that I, I did not present here today. Okay. And uh, I guess one last one while, while I have you. Um, uh, and there's a, a pretty uh, you know, strong link between ERK and integrin activation. Do um, you see any changes in tumor invasiveness um, between the patients um, and your, or your responders and non-responders, given that ERK may, may provide a higher integrin activation and have more invasive tumors? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I have not explored that at all. Uh, okay. So that, that is interesting. This is, this is why at some point, you know, paper takes the life of its own and we deposit the data and smart people like you can do it beyond <laughs> what we originally thought of. But no, it's a great question. Cool. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, that was that was awesome. That was a great talk. Um, is that a quick question? I think Dom and uh, Dr. Brian both sort of um, uh, sort of uh, asked a question we just cut off there, sorry, asked the question that uh, I was thinking as well, but um, you mentioned in the last slide, you know, sort of necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, any leads on anything else that you could be thinking of that could play a role in what you guys have done so far? Or I guess I'm kind of asking you to tell me what else you guys are working on, sort of, but um, anything you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say this in a humble way. I don't know that, uh, what I mean by necessary, but not sufficient is we clearly saw Patients who had high PR that didn't live long, mm 
and 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 we but we never saw patients that had low PR that live long. Um, and so I think you are, you know, there's a T cell component to this. We clearly see T cells. I think you need antigens, right? So I don't know that PR solves the equation if, if the tumor is not antigenic, but I also don't think a tumor that is antigenic when there's no uh, good microenvironment, if you will, would help. But, but I don't know the answer to your question. I, I, I'm still perplexed and trying to think about it. I want to be open-minded. There's so many smart people working in immunotherapy. But I do think that the intrinsic tumor signaling and map kinase plays a role. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonaman. Really exciting findings, congratulations. I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one is if you think that the location of the biopsy can affect or bias the results when assessing PR expression. Yes, sure. So I definitely think there's a, I would say intratumoral heterogeneity in, in uh, map kinase signaling and PR. Um, and you know, one of the things I'll tell you, the quality of the biopsy is super important. What we did really to level the plane there is we had uh, our neuropathologist look at all these samples and they would just tell us and, and delineate the area that has tumor and occasionally they would just tell us this sample is garbage. Like you, you can't really be looking at tumor in this one. And we did this with the h and &E. So yes, good biopsy is, is important. A larger biopsy gives you more representative uh, uh, sample to look at. Uh, what, what Victor did is he sampled as much as he could. And, you know, in spite of the intratumoral heterogeneity, I think the differences across patients were robust enough that we could see who would live longer or not. Thank you. And for the second one, in, in your experience working with, with uh, sonication, do you think that it, it can be useful in the context of checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question as well. Uh, uh, very, very nice. It, it's a topic for another uh, Miami <laughs> symposium uh, talk. But, <laughs> the next yeah, one. We, we, we do think we can, and there's some evidence from several groups that actually immunotherapy can enhance its penetration across the blood-brain barrier with this ultrasound technology. And we have a clinical trial program uh, looking at this. Uh, yes, I, my, my results are not as mature as I wish right now. So we might need to wait a little bit before we schedule that one. <laughs> but it's definitely playing a role. Thank you. And then we have a, a couple of questions here in the last minutes uh, from the audience. One um, uh, wanted to know what your correlation between PERC was and IDH1 status, which I think you showed, but I'll just add to that. Do you feel like you had enough of the IDH1 mutant um, uh, to kind of really fulfill that answer, I guess? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. The answer is worse than the question. Uh, you know, I wanted to do the analysis with as many patients as I could, so I did not exclude the IDH1 patients. As the expected demographically, they represented about 10% of our samples. And so with very little samples, I, I have a very hard time making any claims. I don't think I'm powered to, to, to look at whether PR is different for those patients. Uh, it's another good question. It could be looked at uh, uh, by other courts and groups, but I don't think we have enough patients to answer that. Are you gonna, are you gonna redo all those papers with CD, CTL4? <laughs> well, you know, a great question. I think the, the, the main point here is, you know, I was very disappointed. There's this moment at Snow once a year, right? Where you sit on this very large auditorium and you listen to the latest 700 patient phase three trial that is completely negative. And you walk out of that room and this happened again this year with another checkpoint blockade study. And you really ask yourself, okay, it's negative, but what, what did they learn? Yeah. Yeah. And, of, and I, I tell you anecdotally, I reach out to BMS to get the samples from these trials to do the same analysis, and they don't have it. And so what I think it's, it's unfortunately sad is you could do it. It's ironic because they ask for like 10 vials of tissue yeah. when they do the trial, right? <laughs> so it's not, it's not there. Or, you know, the point is negative trials are, are, are sad, but trials that you don't learn anything from are even sadder. And so... I think the opportunity to do really cool research as clinicians 
it's really basically based on the ability to get samples that are linked to clinical outcomes. And so if I had those samples in my hands, I would absolutely run with it. Um, but that's the way of, you know, any of us doing good research, we would need to just be organized and figure out how patients are being treated and which certain samples correspond to what patients. And then you could do all these interesting clinical observations. And then, you know, I know we have a lot of younger people on, on the talk from around the country. And so I wanted to also touch, touch base on your success with all of these papers that you've been getting into these amazing journals. What advice do you have for, for preparing, you know, um, good, good, good experiments and also knowing how much to put into a paper to dice it up appropriately for, for, for a, a top journal uh, submission like you've done in so many times now? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Uh, so I will tell you a few things. First of all, good journals are not good for your career. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really interesting, but there's really good journals that are not these journals and that they're very reasonable. These journals are really picky and they're very difficult. And honestly, some of my mentors really advised against these. So I would really not focus on the journal, but if you wanted to try some of these, which do it at your own risk. It's good to A, have simultaneous productivity in journals that are not as picky so that you don't bet all your career on that one paper. Uh, but if you're gonna try these, I think a few things are important. First of all, human data does well on big journals. Again, you know, if I was doing a story with mice, the, the bar would be much higher. But if you're doing an original observation linked to patients living longer or shorter, that's already gonna be taken way more seriously. So if from the get-go, if you wanna publish a paper like this, I think it's really good to just work with human specimens and, and, and link to data. I think that's the first thing I would say. Second, um, I think it's very important with these journals to have one or two claims and to write it in a way that you are very, very neutral about the results and you're not selling a used car, you're just basically showing what you found. And the more independent ways you can show the same thing is better than having too many claims. So the main reason why these papers are not reviewed is because the claim is not big enough, but you don't, if you send a paper to a journal and it doesn't get reviewed, you know, nobody lost anything, you lost a week. Yeah, but if a paper goes to one of these journals and gets reviewed and a year later it's rejected, it's not because the claims were not big, it's because you couldn't rigorously prove that claim over and over. And so going back to this story, I'll tell you, this second paper that we published in Nature Cancer was under review for a very long time and everybody agreed that it was very important work, but nobody was convinced that we had you know, correctly address rigorously whether the samples were of high quality and whether the staining was specific. And so finding a thousand ways to prove the same in a rigorous way with an open mind that you might actually not prove it and then the reviewer might be right and you might just learn that you, you were after an artifact, I think it's a good strategy. Uh, but it's a risky strategy. I think I try to do a lot of papers that are not going to journals like this. That's, that's great advice. That's great advice. Okay, anything else? All right, well, thank you so much again and congratulations. You guys are building a powerhouse there at Northwestern. And so keep, uh, keep up the great work and stay safe. Thank you and thanks Ivan, uh, Mike, uh, for, for all this uh, amazing symposium. I always enjoy it. No problem, take care. Bye. Thank you.